Tomorrow is a big day for me. I'll attend a virtual parent-teacher conference in the morning and then get on a plane by myself, fly to Arizona, and hug my parents for the first time since March 7th of 2020. I'm 42, fully vaccinated, and I still need my mom and dad. It has been hard, so hard, to wait for those hugs. I've had to fight all my better instincts multiple times, wage war on my heart by staying still when my body has felt compelled to fly. Our understanding of care and how we give and receive it has been transformed by the last 14 months. Care in these times has been staying home, limiting contact with others, paying close attention to physical symptoms of illness, and getting creative around food, friendships, and fun. Our justice work and how we show up in solidarity within struggles has at times confounded and confronted us with new understandings of our privilege, our fears, and our priorities. We've learned that pre-pandemic normal was not working for so many, and while we feel pulled to return to normalcy, we are also tasked with building a new normal that is radically inclusive, radically caring, and radically different than what was comfortable the last time I hugged my parents when I delivered them to the curb of the Denver International Airport last year. Today, we are considering our sixth principle in Unitarian Universalism, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. It's lofty, aspirational, and huge. How would we even recognize that we had arrived at our goal since this sort of world is not one that any of us have ever actually experienced? It's a tall order, especially as we emerge from a world pandemic. Peace, liberty, justice for all in a world community. What about the work that needs attention locally congregationally, or even within family units that have been stuck together for 14 months. Peace, liberty, justice for all. It's beginning the work, even if we cannot imagine reaching its completion in our lifetime. The goal stated in our sixth principle is aspirational and abstract. Community, however, is something that I know and I recognize. I think of you and your amazing face walking through the door at 1400 Lafayette, and I've experienced community at First Unitarian with the people I want to be with, all in one place, week after week, growing together. We've shared food, danced together, sang with tears in our eyes, laughed and grieved and lifted one another, and I've been soothed healed and transformed here in this community. Not the building, but in the community. And I miss you something fierce after all of this virtual togetherness because I need soothing. I need healing because I need transformation. And maybe you need those things too. We've experienced collective and ongoing trauma as a result of the last 14 months, the last five years, and even the last four centuries, trauma is stored in the body and processed by the brain. How is your brain these days? Mine is foggy, like a processor that's been working overtime. My executive functioning has been challenged. I've lost access to words, trains of thought and focus. My capacity feels limited. My anxiety and depression both returned with a vengeance. So it's a bit crowded up there. These are symptoms of trauma. No need to play the trauma game. Since your brain doesn't differentiate between mild trauma and hot, extra spicy trauma. Trauma compounds and it takes time and often intention to heal. Trauma rarely heals on your scheduled timeline and certainly is not a linear process. So I'm encouraged by the most recent discussions around mental health, awareness, access to care and resources, and even the capitalist hyper-focus on commodified self-care. Though I do enjoy a good non-COVID massage, 
I felt so very seen when I encountered a simple one sentence tweet from an Islamic female organizer, Nikita Valero. She wrote, shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. She wrote this as she processed the trauma of the attack on Muslim worshipers in Christchurch, New Zealand on March 15th, 2019, exactly one year before the pandemic came for our world community. Community trauma will not heal without community care. Focusing on individual response does not adequately address the community impact. We need community care. But what is community care? It is decidedly not self-care. Community care is based on the notion that humans are social and cooperative beings. Community care happens when people are committed to leveraging their privilege to be there for one another in various ways because they know that you might be a caretaker one day and cared for the next. Community care requires more than one person engaged in meaningful, repeated, and routine care that comes from a place of intentional compassion. It is collective in focus. It asks, what do we need instead of what do I need or what do you need or what do they need? When collective trauma occurs, self-care is not enough to heal. We need one another. So then how does community care present itself when we cannot physically attend to one another? It requires awareness, dedication, creativity, and can feel very counterintuitive. Community care does not fix issues, but it does provide relief. Cover your face, wash your hands, stay apart, limit your trips and put up barriers between yourself and others, keep your kids home from school and away from their friends, vote, get vaccinated. I'm grateful for the imaginations of former children who grew to be the scientists who are actively manifesting the magic of these vaccines available to some of us today. Without them, hugging my parents tomorrow would be even further delayed. And I mentioned that I'm traveling alone without my unvaccinated kids who miss their grandparents. We've talked about privilege here before at First Unitarian and the pandemic offers for our consideration now, vaccination privilege amidst all of the other sorts of privilege that bump around within our complex identities, fully vaccinated, half sedated, waiting for a vaccine. There's an active spectrum going on. I'm fully vaccinated, Team Moderna, but I see you, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca. Vaccinations are one example of community care, and still, there is privilege present. Can you be vaccinated? Can everyone yet? And will they when they can be? Still, vaccinations are here and they are happening. Not far behind might just be a return to our community, ready to soothe and heal and transform. So what do we need? We need soothing. We need healing and we need transformation. We also need one another and we need community care. But I'm here today to remind you that many in our community cannot yet safely gather. Our children, our children do not have access to vaccines. COVID-19 affects children. I know we received some comforting but inaccurate information early on that kids were unaffected, but that is not true. Now there are variants and long-term health impacts haunting parents who have kept their kids home from school and the parents who have sent their kids back into schools. Remember our community room on Sundays before the pandemic? We had children running through our legs, snatching snacks off the counter, hiding in small spaces, laughing with us at stories, bringing us pipe cleaner art, hanging out in the peaceful play space during worship and demanding our focus while we tried to schedule that next committee meeting or church function. Would a return 
without them be the return to normalcy that so many of us yearn for. Fellow religious educator Ty Resendez de Perez has said of reopening discussions that are happening around the continent, it becomes a matter of inclusion and would call for a very clear description of who is not welcome, which is, to be honest, a reflective practice that UU community should start doing anyway. As we build a new normal, might that reflective practice asking who is not welcome at any moment in our community, help us practice and reach toward world community. How do we practice radical community care for the vulnerable still among us who are unable to be vaccinated? It's more than just children and youth. It's your friend with a pre-existing condition or an immunocompromised family member. It's a volunteer who's recovering from a transplant or the beloved adult who just isn't sure yet. Each decision that we make as a congregation is a chance to practice community care. Let us find the patience to be fully inclusive of all our vulnerable community members across our programming because that is where the real magic and the fun will be found. We envision a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And we practice world community building when we strive for these same things locally within ourselves and our congregation. Our mission at First Unitarian Denver is this, joining hands and voices for justice and peace, we inspire lives of joy and spiritual integrity, growing an inclusive community of courage and caring. Community is inspired, justice is realized, diversity is celebrated, souls are grown in love and service. There is an aspirational element there, but also familiar lived experience. When we are reflective about how our congregation builds community, we can ask questions about who is being left out and how might we shift and widen our own circles. We can ask the questions over and over again, each answer shifting us closer toward the congregational and the world community that we hope to build. We forgive our mishaps, acknowledge our frustrations, do better when we know better, and make space for healing. It's messy, ongoing, and necessary work that our sixth principle calls us to do over and over again. Peace, liberty, and justice are not static destinations. The Unitarian Universalist Association offers up support for church communities in a new and ever-growing collection of resources about our shift toward multi-platform ministry. Virtual offerings, in-person offerings, asynchronous offer offerings, small groups, innovations in technological considerations, and so on. It's enough to make my own head spin a bit. We just did this overhaul to completely go to virtual church, and now considering another major upheaval is exhausting. Amongst the resources offered in a video from Reverend Sunshine Jeremiah Wolf, one takeaway is this. It may take congregational communities five to 10 years to heal our collective trauma following the pandemic. <sighs> There's anxiety there because I wanna get past it. I wanna move on, let's get on track. I don't have time for it to take that much time. And there is spaciousness there and an invitation to resist urgency and rushing the sort of, of rush that we did at the beginning of the pandemic to pivot. We can rest, we can pause when we need to pause. We can keep a level eye on inclusivity and deep community caring. And there will be trauma residue. We cannot self-care our way through the healing. Community care is our lifeboat along the way. So let us accept the spaciousness available in a long-term process and honor one another in our community mission as we co-create a new normal with love and intentional compassion. At First Unitarian, I believe that we offer tremendous community care. 
Let us continue that practice by following the example we witnessed earlier in the service during the time for all ages. As a community, we can imagine, act, reflect, forgive, and heal on our way toward our new normal at First Unitarian and a new vision of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all.